in Darlington, the birthplace of the railways. I've travelled thousands of miles on the railways. I think it's something we just all take for granted. But we're going back to the Victorian period, that pioneering era of steam, to try and solve one of the strangest mysteries we've ever been presented with. So join us as we separate fact from fiction, hunt for clues and show you how to spot the history that's right under your nose. I'm Jonathan Foyle, architectural historian. I'm looking for hard evidence. This is all that's left of one of the hubs of Victorian industry. I'm Miranda Kristovnikov, out to find the truth behind local legends. So he'd be slugging his tea, tea. as he was as he going. travelled on. And archive expert Nick Barrett looks for documentary proof held in the archives. He must have been revered in the local community to warrant an entry of this nature. Darlington in County Durham is the home of the railways. In 1825, the first passenger steam railway opened, running between Stockton and Darlington. Spool forward to 1910, and this obelisk was erected at nearby Ferry Hill Station, in memory of local railwayman John Lamb. Now, toy shop owner Barry Lamb has been looking into his family history and wants to know if John Lamb was his great-grandfather. Is Lamb a common name around here? Barry? Not around this area, we didn't think. Uh, I thought we were the only lambs in Darling, but when you start to dig into the uh, history, I found out there's thousands of lambs, particularly in the northeast. The only tie-up we have is that his, my grandfather's name, George Herbert, John Lamb did have a son called George Herbert. Right. So there's a possible connection there, but nothing concrete to Nothing go at all, no. It's all showed in history. My parents died when I was young, and all I've got is a box of photographs of the old gentlemen and ladies. But amongst them all was one photograph of the obelisk. So one day we did actually come up with a family, and it's still here. An engine driver, JP and chairman of the local council, this granite obelisk was erected in his honour shortly after his death. So what did this northern lad do to be remembered, as Cleopatra was? He was an engine driver. That is the remarkable thing, I suppose. He's the only engine driver in the world that's had a granite obelisk. In, uh, <laughs> that's quite in impressive for an engine driver, is. isn't it? When you read the local papers, he's always uh, referred to as the revered gentleman. An engine driver, revered gentleman. You wouldn't think people would see engine drivers. They're hidden away yeah. at the front of the train and, and not really... A, a, a visible face. He must you? have done something really special in his life. Gosh. It'd be really interesting to find out. So we, we don't know if he's a relative. No. Nope. We don't know really what he did to deserve the obelisk. Yeah. That is a real mystery, is why the obelisk was put up in his memory. And then if uh, that is, uh, we find out on that, if he is my great grandfather, great. Our job is to discover whether Barry really is John Lamb's great grandson, find out why John received his memorial, and to step back into the world of a Victorian train driver. This guy Lamb sounds like a really fascinating fellow, doesn't he? Doesn't he? He's a train driver, he's got an obelisk erected to him. I mean, that's bonkers, isn't it? it I mean, how many engine drivers do you know? I mean, let alone None. famous <laughs> ones. But I tell you what, my um, family comes from the railways too, the same line, because my great uncle Jack was the fireman on the Flying Scotsman. Yeah, he used yeah. to shovel coal from London to Edinburgh. I see no spade shaped monument to him. So I don't know what John Lamb actually did. He must have done some great act of bravery or something like that. Maybe Jonathan wants to find inspiration for his painting, and I want to know more about the man himself. Well, I want to get a sense of what Darlington was like in the Victorian age when John Lamb would have been driving trains through here. I mean, what did the railways contribute to the commerce and the buildings of the town? And what, were, what was the railway architecture like, the goods yards? I mean, the great sheds that might have disappeared since that period. It's a very local story and somebody locally is going to know a little bit about that obelisk and maybe know a bit about this guy as well. So there might be a lot more lambs sort of gambling around. I think lambs gambling, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and so a transport revolution began, turning Britain into the world's first railway nation. By 1852, a mere 27 years later, a skeleton of tracks was in place, enabling countrywide travel. The railways changed society forever and opened up a world of new opportunities like commuting and seaside holidays. But not without opposition. The Duke of Wellington was incensed that working class people were now mobile. I wonder if the monument can give me any more clues and go back for another look. Nine out of ten times if I see an early 20th century monument, 
then it's going to be about the First World War, isn't it? 1914 to 18. You often find public subscription as paid for monuments with a whole list of names of people of the town or parish who have died. But this one's 1910. It's just before the war. So it doesn't really tell us how he died or why it's there. It just says, erected by public subscription. He's the chairman of the body of the Rural District Council. Well, I haven't seen many monuments to councillors today like this, so what was this extraordinary chap up to? And why, in the middle of Darlington, with, with um, sandstone everywhere, is this made of granite? Because this is a Scottish stone. This is Aberdeen area, I think. How did this chunk of stone get here? Was it transported by rail? The sculptor has given his name here. It's Jones and Sons of West Hartlepool. And Hartlepool is a dock, so it might be an irony that this stone was imported from Scotland by sea and not the railways at all. Local journalist Chris Lloyd has written several articles about John Lamb and his monument for the Darlington-based newspaper The Northern Echo. Can he flesh out the story? Is this what he looked like? That is him. That is well. he, yes. A reader just emailed it in to me saying um, that he had been doing his family tree for about 10, 15 years and oh the picture just cropped up 30, 40 miles away from where, where he had lived in, some, in a completely different family tree, but the family trees all intertwined. And so if you get all of the readers of a, of a local newspaper kind of doing your research for you, then uh, right. you can pay dividends. The photo's a great start. We now know what John Lamb looked like. Can these old newspapers reveal anything else? Well, we have very little. We have, uh, what have we got here? Two paragraphs, about 30 lines in the local newspaper that sum up his entire life. What does it tell us about him then? Well, it tells us the, the lovely details of how, how, how he died, going on a, on a train up to Newcastle and uh, ending up with a small mutton bone stuck in his throat that caused him to pass away. Pretty drastic cool stuff. Very, very apt that his neighbour's lamb and he died <laughs> in the mutton <laughs> the bone mutton in his throat, bone, yes. yeah. <laughs> his bluff, hearty manner and invariable good nature made him extremely popular with all who knew him. Lovely. Another obit I found uh, one of the other local weeklies said he, he, he was a, a genial and portly figure, which is lovely, lovely for him. I suddenly realise I'm handling a historic document and not wearing gloves. Why is that? We're not a library, we're not a museum. Um, we work, we use the, these papers. If you want to, to, to wear your gloves, then you can go over the road to the, the proper local history it's library. It's nice but, to feel the paper, Yes, isn't it? it's great. Although, if you wear a white shirt, it's a very, very bad. <laughs> you got all lucky move. already, so didn't you? Don't ever yeah. wear a white shirt when we're <laughs> dealing with these terrible old newspapers. Nick, it's Miranda. Yes, I have some family tree research for you to do. I want Nick to find out more about John Lamb's family history. The newspaper obituary is useful, but we need something official, like a birth certificate. Yeah, it's really important that we find this one out, OK? OK, bye. Having scoured the obelisk, I got permission to visit the place where we believe John Lamb spent most of his working life, a thriving railway complex with a station, marshalling yard and sheds. I'm shocked by the scant remains of this hub of 19th century endeavour. There goes a train. It's only taking people <laughs> up to Old Edinburgh, but in the 1850s, a million tons of coal was brought through here. Imagine that, just total rumbling the whole time as coal brought down from Newcastle and the, all of the seams uh, of the north, and it all focused between Hartlepool and here at Ferry Hill. So what John Lamb knew was a very different place than we know today. Industry brought wealth to Ferry Hill. You'd scarcely guess it today. And this photograph, gosh, this shows where I would have stood. I'd have been standing around about there in, what, this looks like the 1920s, so it's just after his death, but it still gives you a sense of that th thriving industry. Ferry Hill Station opened in 1839. Five years later, it was a stop-off on the main London to Edinburgh route. By 1863, 140 trains passed through the station each day, carrying passengers and freight like roadstone, coal and fish. In 1913, the North Eastern Railways network had 500 stations and issued nearly 60 million third-class tickets. But in 1967, Ferry Hill Station closed. What have we got left of it? Look. A few bits of sandstone rubble from what was left 
of quite a large Victorian complex, next to nothing. So I need to piece together what this place looked like when John Lamb knew it in the 1890s. And to do that, I've got to imagine what the building was like about 100 yards long, coming down to here, and fill in the space, which is now nothingness, with the sound, the noise of engines, the steam, the smell of sulfur and coal, the busyness, the human action here, and try and change it from nothing into everything on paper. The local industry has disappeared, but this Victorian park survives, and it's a good place to catch up with Miranda. So what happened down the Northern Echo? Well, I met a really interesting local journalist who helped paint a bit of, more of a picture about Lamb. I do have this photograph. You do? This is my one result yesterday. This hey. is the man himself. A portly and genial <laughs> chap Hello, who John choked Lamb. on a mutton bone. That's no how he died. way. Lamb, mutton bone. That's cannibalism. It's sort of ironic, isn't it, really? But it wasn't a heroic death. He wasn't saving anybody. I, I still don't. No, I don't know why this monument. I'll make of it. So, hmm. More of a mystery. Where I want to go next is the museum. I want to find out a bit more about life as a train driver. What, what did John Lamb do from day to day? I believe the museum is the first Darlington station. Is that right? Yes. So we could take a trip there. Well, that's two birds with one stone, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. Well, two sheep with one bone, maybe. Historic railways transport me into the past. At last, I've found some inspiration for my reconstruction, some real steam trains. We've got to catch a train. It's still here, thankfully, and it looks like it might be for the next 25 years or so. I will need to get a sense of what an engine was like that John Lamb would have driven. Now, this is the late 19th century. Look at the date there, 1875. So this is the old-fashioned um, the big bell in the middle of the boiler. Look at this open cab down the back. You can imagine that, the wind whistling past you as a driver there. These to me, they, these are like male engines. I always, I always sort of put uh, genders on, on, on these old steam engines. That's a male one. All the bits are on the outside, you know, and you can sort of get a sense of the muscularity of the thing. Whereas one of these, these are a little bit after John Lamb's lifetime, the streamlined type. And um, these are so smooth, they're encased, all the bits are on the inside. And to me, these are much more feminine. They're beautiful, streamlined, elegant things. These are gorgeous. I love them. So, but unfortunately, I can't draw one for my reconstruction of the kind of engine house that John Lamb would have known. I've got to go back to the period around 1900 and go for the ones where all the engineering is on the outside, so it's going to be a real tricky business to try and draw everything precisely. Can steam expert Fred Ramshaw get us further along the track? I want to ask him about John Lamb's working life as an engine driver. The driver would be this side, looking out, depending on seeing where he's going. That side would be the fireman, and his job would be to, sh would be to shovel coal from the tender into the firebox. So on a typical journey, um, how much coal would be shoveled? Well, this, this engine worked mainly from Newcastle to Edinburgh, which was around about 100 miles or so. And for that time, he would shovel four or five tonnes of coal. Right. So a, a very demanding job and quite a, quite a grim one. Absolutely. I mean, you're completely open to the elements. If it was raining, snowing, what a miserable environment to be working in. Dead right. Your front part of the body would be roasting. The back part would be absolutely freezing. Yeah. You know, so I would imagine arthritis and lumbago was pretty ripe in those days. In such cramped conditions, did they always get on? As in life, nine hours out of ten, yes. But uh, there are stories of drivers putting a chalk mark down the centre of the cab floor and saying, that is your side, this is mine, thou shalt not cross. <laughs> it can't always have been so grim. What about the perks of life on the footplate? Drivers and firemen would actually cook breakfast, bacon and eggs and so forth, actually on the firing shovel in the fire. Well, you've got a ready-made stove there, so it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? But, but, but a pretty dirty stove as well. Well, how did, how did that well they, they, would, they would put the, fi the, the shovel in the fire to sort of sterilise it first, right. and then some bacon, bacon fat and eggs and so forth. Black bacon and eggs. Oh, yes. oh yes. <laughs> With all this heat, they must have been thirsty. 
Ah, the tea can. So that would be their sort of equivalent of a thermos, but of course it didn't need to be insulated because it'd be kept warm on the furnace. Absolutely, that's right. Fantastic. So he'd be slugging his tea, tea as he was as going. he travelled on. Yes. Fantastic. So, how long did it take to reach the esteemed rank of engine driver? On well, many, many years. A driver initially would be, would be a cleaner, which would clean the engines. Then he would become a fireman and eventually to a driver. Now that could be, most drivers were in the early 60s. So you could be, be a fireman for 20, 30 years or so before you eventually became a driver. And then it depended on dead men's shoes. As a driver died or retired, eventually he moved up the, the ladder. This was a skilled job and the railway companies did not want to lose drivers, so they paid an above average wage for an industrial worker. Let's get down amongst the mechanics. It's about my height. A bit more, actually. <laughs> I was optimistic there. They're about getting on for seven feet high, these things. Now, if you are stoking up the engine to get seven foot high iron wheels turning, imagine what that feels like, the first lurch of this thing. And what a noise it makes if it comes into a work sh shed, if it's trundling in, and you know, these tons of iron are rumbling in over you, you've got to get down underneath to maintain this thing, because all of the, look at all the bearings, all of the, ah, incredible amount of, the uh, pistons and um, the cams and so on, they're all underneath there. And to get access to them, imagine that. Imagine you're having about 100 tons of iron over your head that you've got to make sure you get right because hundreds of people are going to put their life in your hands when you take this thing out and take them to where they've got to go. It's an awesome responsibility for driver and mechanic. And I've got full admiration for them. Curator Bob Clark has dug out some rare pieces of railway heritage from the museum archives that have a link with John Lamb. His position of engine driver brought with it the privilege of a free train pass for life. But that's his third class on it. Well, on the railway, an engine driver is just an engine driver. He's not a company director, he's not a senior manager. So he gets his third class uh, pass, not a first class pass, but it's, a, it's still a jolly worthwhile thing to have. Uh, gets him and the family on holiday free, um, gets him to and from work. Uh, you just don't have to, this, it, it's, it's a perpetual rail ticket. Right. And they, they lasted for life. And yes, third class, because your engine men were industrial aristocracy, but they were still workers. Can Bob shed any light on why such a magnificent monument was erected in memory of John Lamb? We're before the First World War. First World War changed a lot of things. But before then, it's a very sentimental society. Victorian, Edwardian England. If you had a retirement, someone's portrait was painted, or their bust was carved, or a memorial scroll would be produced for them. By the standards of the day, this was a quite natural thing to do to someone who died in quite tragic circumstances, who had been a distinguished member of local society. But it wasn't that they'd done anything that important. It was just an occasion that had to be marked in the way that society did it then. There wasn't one single heroic act that had made John Lamb special, but a lifetime's hard work, initially as part of an exciting new technology engulfing the nation, and later serving his local community as a councillor and JP. So what I'm doing is drawing the engine in here most closely datable to John Lamb's lifetime. And uh, the museum curator suggested John Lamb may well have driven it because there are only about 20 of these things made and these are the local engines, so they'd have operated on the local lines. So uh, it's a handsome thing, but to get the full sense of what his life and career would have been like, I'm going to reconstruct a works yard shed full of engines, full of steam and um, you know, get the whole visceral sense of that time and place. We're making steady progress, but still lack real evidence. Barry has been wondering for 20 years if John Lamb was his great-grandfather. If we can prove that family connection, it will give him the news he really wants. Nick's come to the museum and is searching through railway company records for a reference to John Lamb. 
Wow. And he finds an unexpected lead. Now, this is quite something. This is a portrait of a chap called Richard Monty, who worked for the company in the 1850s and 60s. Now, he was a railway guard, no one of any great importance, but clearly either he or the company felt it was worth making this fantastic portrait of, which goes to show that railway staff were seen in their own eyes and the company eyes as important members of the community and perhaps gives a bit of context to the memorial to John Lamb. Maybe it wasn't so unusual after all. This is quite something and would have cost a lot to commission. But not everything from those times has been so lovingly preserved. My continuing search for an authentic engine shed has brought me here, to a modern-day car breaker's yard in Darlington. This is what I need to see to complete my painting. I suppose this shed was always intended for servicing vehicles of a sort, but it's safe to say its golden days are over. It's now a place where cars come to die, and it is itself decaying. But unlike Ferry Hill, this building can still reveal something of its great industrial past. Look at that! P712R. Do you reckon that's from a... Is that from a piece of railway? to do with the railway, that. Yeah. Rails. Or tram lines coming down. Oh, there, look, there's an iron rail there. That's what it is. There's an iron rail right there. That's carved out of sandstone. You can see the, the, the little marks left by the, uh, the chisel. So this is, tells you something about the pride that the builders had in the railways. They're prepared to ornament not just the outside of the building, but inside in nicely cut stone. Excellent. Beneath the decay, I've seen enough of this Victorian engine shed to begin my painting, a reconstruction of the interior of the one John Lamb worked in at Ferry Hill Station, which was demolished in 1949. Trying to paint what it would have felt like to arrive at work at Ferry Hill on a January morning when John Lamb went down to the station and walked into the engine shed to get the engine stoked up. That would probably have been about 4 a.m. <laughs> and then maybe at home the embers of his coal fire were still smouldering in the hearth as he left. I remember when I was a kid in the mid-70s I could still smell coal fire and the sulphur when I got off the school bus and the autumn leaves and I knew it was just going to get colder from then on but getting up early in a January to go and stoke the engine up in the 1890s, imagine that. Well I'm trying to. So there he is, he's been there for two or three hours while the engine's warming up. Freezing cold outside, some northern snow, but inside, belching smoke filling the building. Your clothes must have reeked of it. You climb aboard the hot engine and you back it out on the first of your journeys to ferry thousands of people around the country in the depths of winter. And at well, six in the morning, as dawn struck in a January in the 1890s, I reckon John Lamb would have walked into the engine shed to see something like this. Finally, the documents which Nick's been waiting for arrive. Among them is the marriage certificate of Barry Lamb's grandfather, George Herbert Lamb, our first documented family link between Barry Lamb and John Lamb. This was the key thing for me. His father's name was John Lamb. So this is Barry's great-grandfather, John Lamb. And even Excellent. better still, he's a foreman and an engine man. That's so, fantastic. Exactly. Yeah, this is the great. first bit of proof. Um, this could be any John Lamb working in any particular place. True. So I look for George Herbert's birth records. Okay. And this just confirms what I thought about the marriage. George Herbert, again, John Lamb. We've got the name of his wife, Elizabeth Ann Lake Ward, formerly Davison. And that's the, that's the crucial bit of information. Railway engine driver. Excellent. And he's born in Chilton. So again, right. the location fits. Okay. So Marvelous. for me, this is, this is conclusive proof that John Lamb is Barry's great-grandfather. He's going to be so chuffed. That's the result that we wanted and that's the result that Barry wanted as well. Both documents are supported by a census entry for John Lamb. We finally found our link. I know the quest was really only to find out about John himself, but I just thought it might be quite interesting to go back yet another generation and okay. see what his father was doing. Yeah, and was he involved in the railways as well? Amazingly, he was. Brilliant. Here's the young John Lamb. This is 1861, by the way. Right. And his father was a William Lamb, yeah. and his mother was a Bell Lamb, which is rather yeah. intriguing. Yeah. But the father's occupation was a railway plate layer. Uh, so this is the sort of occupation where the railways are first being set out, and he would be involved on the construction side. 
So it's really ironic that his son eventually drives trains across these tracks, that so he's a locomotive driver, and his father's actually put them down in the first place. Nice one. Nice that the railways are sort of running in the family as well. Absolutely. With our investigation complete, we meet to share information. We've learned that the railwaymen really were the glamour boys of their day. This sounds to me like Top Gun uh, in, <laughs> of the 1890s, steam trains rather than jet planes. You know, Absolutely. Imagine him dismounting from the steam engine in slow motion, gazing impressively <laughs> into the distance. Trains were the primary mode of transport for everyone, and this added to the driver's prestige. An engine driver was a very important job. He was basically like an airline pilot, a coach driver and a taxi driver all rolled into one. In those days, you went everywhere by foot or by bike or by train, and everybody used the train. As chairman of the local council and a JP, John's civic achievements were visible throughout the community. So he didn't save anybody's lives. He didn't change the course of history. He does. He's just a really nice guy. But he probably changed the course of a lot of people's personal history and made life that bit better for them and therefore he has a far greater impact over a longer period of time and that's why people like John Lamb are so important in the local community. And looking through the council minutes from the time of John's death, Nick found a poignant reminder. Motion of two councillors to express condolence to Mrs Lamb and family on their loss. The only other time you get a note of condolence like this is when King Edward VII dies. So to me, this strikes me as a very important moment. He must have been revered in the local community. How will Barry react to the answer to the question that's preoccupied him for 20 years? I've been coming up with a, a picture of what an engine driver's life would have been like in the oh. 1890s. So Ferry Hill today, not a great deal there, is there? Not There's left of the railway heritage but if I show you this and suggest to you that John Lamb would have gone to work to see something like that. Not for you? Yeah. I thought it was just sadding. It was a real thriving place. A million tons of coal came through there a year in the Victorian period. A million tons? A million tons. You could imagine something was there. But you I'd would never, never recognize that today no, would you? No. No. No it's just flat land. Yeah. yeah. There was just one more thing to do. Give Barry his history mystery file containing all the vital documents linking him with John Lamb. This is the birth certificate for, for George Herbert Lamb, who's your grandfather. Wow. So this is the bit of information that you really want That's to know at the never end of the ever day. Seen, yeah. Okay. 1881, in the district of Sedgefield, John Lamb. Occupation of father, railway engine driver. No, never this seen is the it. proof that that memorial is erected to your great grandfather. So we are famous in the family. With Your family, family seems to, they seem to stretch back beyond John Lamb into those early pioneering days when Darlington was really the hub of the development of railways in Britain and the world. Absolutely. That is what I wanted to hear. Mm. Good. That we were part of the uh, first railway people to come into the area. Although we don't know what he did to deserve that monument, He's clearly an important fellow, and I, I, I guess you're a bit proud of him, are you? Very proud, yeah. So, always been proud of this John Lamb, whether he was my great grandfather or not, because she always got this feeling that he must have done something for the community. Yeah. To get this obelisk, there was something, but he, as you say, it wasn't one item. It must have been a generation of what he did, sort of stuff. Because he's such a common name that if you went trying to find a John Lamb, you turned up, you know, if pressed on the website, you probably got a thousand. You've got a flock, Lamb. don't you? Yeah, a yeah. flock of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very pleased with this. This has made my day. Well, thanks. So pages and pages. When I get it all out on a night and go through it, but never you go back. The same question was John Lamb, my great grandfather. Well, we're happy to report he is. That's Absolutely. brilliant. Thanks yeah. very much for Thank you, me. Jonathan. Yeah. That's brilliant. That is smashing. Thank you yeah. very Thank much. You. For a free pack of history postcards and information on how to solve your own history mystery, call 0870 900. 0303. Or go to open2.net where you can also find out more about other Open University programmes. For a free pack of history postcards and information on other Open University programmes, call 0870 900 0303 or go to open2.net. <laughs>